Hi everybody, it is Doug here and in this video I'm going to show you how we can modify the HTML of any module that Beaver Builder gives us using a new filter that's been added in Beaver Builder 2. Now before I continue I will say that this is a developer focused tutorial but even if you're not a developer then feel free to follow along anyway because it will give you an idea as to what's going to be possible in the next version of Beaver Builder. So on the screen you will see that we have a pricing table but you will also notice that there are two delicious looking pizzas in each column. So let's go ahead and open the settings form for this pricing table and just see what's going on. Now with a pricing table, we have multiple boxes within it. Uh, and in some cases they'll be called boxes, in other cases they'll be called columns, and that will make a bit more sense as we go through this video. So let's go ahead and edit one of these boxes, uh, in this case the cheese pizza. And you'll see that we have all of the normal fields, the default fields, the title, price box, um, the various features. But you'll also see that we have an additional image field down at the bottom here. And this is a field that I've added myself using a filter, and I'll show you how to do the same shortly. So let's head to the code editor, and I will show you how we can make this happen. So here we are in my code editor, and you'll see that I'm currently working in the functions.php file inside the Beaver Builder theme. Now, Immediately I'm doing two things that I wouldn't recommend. So if you're following along, uh, you can use the functions.php file just to get started, but I would recommend trying to extract this out into a custom plugin, uh, just so it's abstracted away from the theme. Or at the very least, I would uh, use a child theme of the Beaver Builder theme and work in the functions.php file there. So with that said, let's just work out uh, the different steps that we're going to need to take to add an image to the pricing table module. So the first thing we've got to do is filter the settings form uh, for the pricing table box and add a photo field. And then we have to filter the HTML of the module using the new filter that I mentioned earlier and add the image to it. And we're actually going to need a bit of help at this stage. Uh, we're going to use a third party uh, library which is going to allow us to interact with the HTML a bit easier instead of using PHP find and replace and uh, maybe even the PHP HTML functions that exist natively. They're okay to work with, but it's a little bit laborious. Uh, and I found this uh, this other library, which gives us almost jQuery-like access to the HTML that we give it. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's first add a filter for the FL Builder register settings form. And I'm going to pass a callback and this accepts two parameters, which is the form itself, which is an object, and the slug of the form. Let's give it a priority of 10 and specify two parameters that we're passing through. And immediately what I do with any filter that I'm working on, as you might have seen in other videos, is return the value that we need to return because uh, very often I find myself getting errors and it's nearly always this. So we need to make sure that we don't affect every settings form within Beaver Builder. We just want to affect not the settings form of the pricing table, but the settings form of the nested columns within it. So let's just very quickly head back to the browser and figure out what the name of this form is. I'm just going to click on the pricing table and I'm going to right click and inspect this hyperlink here for edit pricing box. And you'll see in the inspector that we have data hyphen type. This is uh, going to give us the name or the slug of the form that we need. In this case, it's pricing column form. So I'm just going to copy that and head back to the code editor and use this value. So now we know the value of the slug of the nested form that we need to target. Let's start by saying if 
pricing column form, which I copied from the inspector, the browser inspector just a moment ago, is equal to the form slug that we're passing or that we're getting rather from this uh, from this filter. Uh, so if the pricing column form matches that slug, then we can go ahead and do what we need to do in here. So what I'm going to do, uh, as you saw in the example earlier, I just added an image to another section within the settings form, but it was within the general tab. And if you're familiar with how settings forms are constructed, we have uh, fields within sections within tabs. So we just need to drill down and add a new section and a field within that section at the bottom of the general tab. So let's go ahead and go into tabs, general, sections, and this is going to be our new section which we'll call image. And this section needs a title. And you can call this whatever you like. I'm just going to be uh, pretty generic and call it image. And of course, we need a field. We'll call the field image as well. And it will be a photo field. Actually, I'll uh, add the label above that just for consistency. Uh, so this field will be labeled image as well. So this is just for the purpose of the person editing the settings form. This is the value that they will see there. So if we save that, that should be all we need to do on the settings form front. So let's head back to the browser and just see what we've done so far. So you'll see here that we have the default pricing table back. I cleared out all of the stuff that I'd done earlier and we are back to square one, uh, apart from, of course, the filter that we've just added. And I'll just note here, uh, as a slight difference to what you might have worked with in the past, if we're ever modifying a settings form using a filter, you didn't previously have to refresh the page. Uh, the reason for that is all of the settings were pulled in via Ajax every time you clicked on a module or any other settings form for that matter, a column, a row, whatever. But in Alpha 3 and onwards, uh, we've now got the concept of instant loading settings forms, which means that all of the settings within them are rendered at the time of the page load. And this makes it very, very quick uh, and very snappy when you open up a settings form, but that does mean you need to refresh the page. So let's go ahead and do that now. And I'm gonna drill down and open up the pricing box or the pricing column settings form for the cheese pizza. And we should see our new image below. So what I'm gonna do is add uh, an image now. So we'll select the pizza image up here, select photo, and I'm gonna choose the medium size like so. And I'll do the same for the meat feast pizza as well. Now, of course, once we save this, we won't see anything on the front end because we haven't actually modified the HTML yet. We've simply modified the settings form. So let's head back to the code editor and start to figure that out. Okay, let's go ahead and start to build the new filter that we need to modify the pricing table. And this filter is called FL Builder Render Module Content. And again, I'm gonna pass a callback. And this too takes a couple of parameters, HTML and the module. And this is the module object which means we have access to all of the module properties, including the settings for it. And let's close that off. A priority of 10, with two parameters passed through, and I'll return the HTML, to make sure that is done like so. Okay, and just at the top here, I'm gonna put a check in to make sure that we're working with the pricing table module. So I'm going to say uh, if pricing table, and in this case is not equal to the module slug, 
we're going to return early because we're going to be doing some slightly heavier work below and we might as well just give the HTML back to the filter if we're not working with the pricing table currently. As I said before, we're working with an object, so we have access to this slug property. And because we're working with the entire module, the entire pricing table module, rather than just a form, that's why we're doing it this way here. So at this stage, we need to pull in the library that I mentioned earlier, which is going to help us work with the HTML a bit easier. So let's head back to the browser and I'll show you the GitHub repository page for this particular library and just give you a quick run through of what it offers us. So here we have the library and it's called HTML page DOM. And it says here, it gives us a PHP implementation of the jQuery DOM manipulation API. And if you're familiar with jQuery, you might have used some methods such as add class, remove class, um, appended jQuery uh, objects to other jQuery objects, change the text of items. Um, so it gives a very familiar API uh, for us to work with, but all in PHP, which is great. So to install uh, this page DOM library, we just simply need to use Composer. And I'm just gonna copy this from here and head back to the code editor to install it. Now my code editor has a terminal built in, so uh, you can use your own terminal or if you're a Windows user, use the command prompt. And you'll see that I'm in the theme directory currently. And I just need to paste in the command as suggested on the GitHub repository page, which is composer require, and then the name of the package. So that's gonna go off and start pulling in the files needed for this library. And there's a couple of dependencies for it. Uh, CSS selectors, MB string, I'm not familiar with that, DOM crawler, and then the library itself, HTML page DOM. And if you've not worked with Composer before, uh, you'll see now that we have a vendor folder in the directory that we installed this package. And it's got the package that we need to work with, which is in this directory here, as well as the dependencies that it requires to operate. You'll also see that we have an autoload.php file. And the great thing with Composer is that we can now just include this single file rather than uh, each individual dependency. So I'm going to go ahead and do that at the top of my functions.php file. So that's all we need to do. We now have the library included in our project, which is great. So let's give us a bit more space to see. I'm going to uh, hide the sidebar, clear and hide the terminal and come back down to where we were before. Now, there may be a few ways to approach this, but what I'm going to do is uh, get the images from each column first. And I'm, I'm going to store those in an array and we can then reference those a bit later once we start working with the new library. So at this stage, Let's just create uh, an array called column images, and that's just gonna be an empty array for now. Now, as I mentioned before, we have access to the module object, which subsequently gives us access to the settings object. So what we can do here is loop through module settings pricing columns as column. So this is going to give us uh, the settings object for each individual column. If you recall from before, we created a new field called image. And the way Beaver Builder works with image fields or photo fields, as they're called, Beaver Builder will give us access to a property in the object, which is the name of the field, image underscore SRC. So by adding an image to the column, we can now check for that by doing, we'll do a if is set. For now there's perhaps some better checks that you can do but that's uh, perhaps up to you and, and your coding style so if we say if column image src is set we're gonna add the source of that image to the array that we created earlier column images so to append we just use the square brackets and say column image src. So this is going to loop through all of the columns in the pricing table. And this means that if you add more columns in the future, 
this is still going to handle that. And it's just going to store each one in a array in column images. So in our case, we have two columns and we have an image set in each. But I guess we've also got to account for if someone only adds an image to maybe one of the columns, or if there's three columns, perhaps there's only an image in two of them. And what I'm actually going to do here to try and get around that is start an index in the for each loop and then pass that index key value in there. So for each iteration through the for each loop, we should add the relevant key here. This means if, for example, column one and column three had images, but not column two, the appropriate key in column images is still going to be set. So we can reference this later. And this will make a bit more sense once we introduce the library to manipulate the HTML, which we're going to do now. So to do that, let's create a new variable and just call it content. And this is going to be a new instance of the library that we pulled in. And this is under the namespace WA72 HTML page DOM. And then it's the HTML page crawler, which we then pass the HTML into. And this HTML is the HTML that the filter is giving us access to. So this is the module HTML. And by passing it through to the HTML page crawler, it's going to give us access to all of the methods that we saw on the GitHub repository. So one of the methods that it gave us access to was filter. And this is going to look through the HTML that the page crawler has access to and find the HTML elements matching the criteria that we give it. So in this case, I want to find all of the columns in the module. So let's just hop back to the browser uh, for a second and we'll find out what we need to look for. OK, so here we are back with the pricing table module. And I'm just going to inspect the element here and see what we're looking for. And you'll see here that we have a couple of columns, uh, FL pricing table, cold two. And each one of these uh, represents a column in the pricing table. Now, I'm assuming, uh, although I don't know for sure, uh, but this number here is going to change depending on the number of columns that uh, exist in the pricing table. So I don't think this is quite a reliable selector to look for, because if we add a, a third one and we're looking for col-2 using our uh, PHP library, it's not going to find it. So I'm just going to drill down a level, and uh, I'll do the same here. And the first div inside of the uh, outer column div seems to be the one we want. You'll see here that it has a column index, column zero in this case, and column one. But it has this slightly more generic column class here, FL pricing table column. And that's what we're going to use to find these columns in the PHP library. So I'm just going to copy that from the inspector. And we'll head back to the code editor and start working with this. OK, so let's create a new variable and we'll call this columns. And this is going to be equal to content filter and the class or the selector, which is a class of FL pricing table column. And that's all we have to do. So that's going to look through the HTML that the module has given us and find the HTML items that have this class name. And because there are two of them in our case, we have two columns. Columns is now going to be an array with two items in it. So all we need to do now is simply loop through the columns. And each column that we have access to here is going to be an HTML element as we found in the HTML. Now, interestingly, with the page crawler library, although we've created a new instance of it up here on the entire HTML for the module, we actually need to do it again for each individual column just so we can work with that. So I'm going to reassign this variable column to a new instance of the page crawler like so, and then pass in the column. So just to reiterate what we've got here, we have the HTML, which has been passed into a, a HTML page crawler instance and saved to the content variable. We're then using the uh, page crawler to find each column in the HTML 
and store each one of those in an array key within the columns variable. We're then looping through each array key or each column and we are passing that or setting that as the variable column, but we then re need to repass that through the page crawler. So we're setting the column variable immediately to the page crawler instance of the column HTML. That might seem a bit confusing, um, but hopefully it'll make sense very shortly. So what we can do here now is because we're looping through, and in fact, what I'm going to do is start another index here. So we've got a, a key to reference. Because we've got a key here and we've got a key here, and we're pretty confident that this key is, is going to uh, only match the columns that have images, we can do something like this. So we can check if column images at the current index of the loop is not empty. So we're just looping through the columns that we have. In this case, we know we've got two. We are starting an index loop as well. So that's going to start at zero and increment by one each time. And we can then use that key or that index to check the column images that we stored before. In fact, what I might do is just make sure it's set as well because we might get an issue otherwise. So column images and then again pass in the key. We're then checking if the column images array has a value at that key and it's not empty. And then what we can do here, again because we've got access to a page crawler instance of the HTML for this individual column, we can go ahead and say column filter and let's hop back to the browser and figure out where we want to put this image. Okay, so let's inspect the element and before I had the image just here. So let's figure out what HTML we have that we can either place the image after or before. You'll see that we have an H2 here, which is inside the wrap. We don't want the wrap. We have the H2 and we have the table price. So what we could do is either add the image after the page title or before the table price, whichever. So in my case, uh, because there's only one H2 per column, I decided to add that after. So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so back to the filter, we know that we want to find all of the H2s in the column of which we know there's only a single one and say after. And quite simply, we now just type HTML as a string. And in here, we can pass in the value from column images at the current loop index of the column images array, like so. And finally, to save this HTML and commit it to the original content variable that we created earlier, we just need to run the save HTML method like so. And we need to now return this modified content back to the filter. And you'll see that previously we said HTML because that matches the value that the filter is giving us. Um, but what we can simply do here is just change that to content because that's going to be the modified uh, HTML as per our stuff that we've done up here. And that's pretty much it. So let's just run through from the top what we've done. We've added a filter for the settings form, not for the pricing table, but for the nested column forms inside it. We've added a new section called image to the general tab. And we've added a field called image to that section. Next, we have used the render module content filter. And we've made sure that we are working with the pricing table. If we're not working with the pricing table, uh, we are returning early and just giving the filter the unmodified HTML back. We're creating an empty array for the column images. So we loop through each column, each pricing column, and we are storing the image source, which if you remember is the name of the field, in our case image, underscore SRC, 
and we're storing that at the current index key in column images. Next, we are creating a new instance of the HTML page crawler, and we're saving that to the content variable and passing in the module HTML that the filter is giving us. The HTML page crawler gives us access to the filter method, which allows us to find different selectors within the HTML that we give it. In our case, we're looking for all items with a CSS class of FL pricing table column. We are then looping through each column that we have, and again, starting an index here and uh, giving ourselves the variable column. Column is then immediately reassigned using the HTML page crawler instance, and that allows us to then check the column, filter through it, and find the H2 title within the pricing column. Of course, we're checking that the image exists and is set within the column images array at the same loop index as the one we're currently in, in the columns. And if it is set and isn't empty, we are then uh, adding this HTML with the source that we stored earlier, just after the H2 title. We're then saving that out and we're returning the content back to the filter. So let's go back to the browser and see what we have. So here we are, let's give that a refresh. Uh, we stored the images earlier. And as you can see, we now have two images. And that's it. We've used a third party library, which I think is super useful. And combined with the filter that Beaver Builder is giving us, it really opens up a lot of opportunities. We can almost do anything we like with every module that exists in Beaver Builder and perhaps some of the add-on packs as well. So I'd invite you at this stage to just start looking at the modules that you commonly use and seeing what you might think is missing from them. And then just seeing if you can maybe add the HTML or the content that you need to fit your needs. So just start with some basic examples. Um, perhaps you want to add some text to a button, or you might want to add a special effect to the photo module, and gradually get a bit more ambitious. I mean, with the pricing table, for example, we could start to think about adding an individual icon for each feature that exists in there. Uh, I don't know entirely how possible that is, but it's certainly something to try. And the more you try these things out, the more you know the boundaries of Beaver Builder. So any questions, let me know in the comments below, and I look forward to seeing what you create.